Sony's newest lens is about to hit shelves, and I've already been shooting with it for weeks. They're showing off its daily versatility, but with a wide 16mm field of view and a big aperture of f1.8, it's obvious that this new addition to the G Lens lineup should be perfect for capturing Starfield landscapes, and released right at the tip off of Milky Way season. Wait a second, did Sony design a lens specifically for this channel? And should you add this to your astrophotography kit when it releases? We're about to find out. Before we get into it, you should be aware that Sony was kind enough to lend this lens to me prior to launch, but they are not sponsoring this video and there was never at any point any discussion of what I should say about any of their products. So let's get to it. With it being the latest lens from Sony, we have to hold it up side by side with their other wide angle lenses that came before. As mentioned, the new 16 mm is in the G lens class. The two G Master wide angle lenses they manufacture have some impressive specs, but they also come at a G Master price. You might say that the lens most closely related to this latest model is the 20mm G, but if your focus is starscapes, the new lens has a wider field of view while being smaller and lighter, not to mention a little bit lower priced. The one non-G lens is the narrowest field of view lens that I've included on this list and is also the least expensive, but we can assume there will be quality differences from that product line. The 24mm G, by comparison, gives a wider view than the 28, is lighter, more compact, and almost as inexpensive while being from a higher product line. For those reasons, this is one of the most commonly owned lenses by new Sony shooters, and incidentally the lens we will be using as our baseline in these tests. It's important to note though that this lens also features the narrowest maximum aperture of this list, and as you'll see that will serve to demonstrate an important contrast in lens choice. On build, the new 16mm 1.8G has a lot of things we've come to expect from Sony lenses. The programmable button and aperture ring click switch are still here, but one interesting addition is the iris lock switch, but it might not be what you think. When in the active position, it simply prevents the aperture ring from entering or leaving auto mode. For those who don't want to accidentally trip into auto when dynamically adjusting aperture, or those who want to make sure the camera software exclusively handles aperture. As someone who sometimes gets anxious about whether or not I had the aperture fully open before I started a time lapse, I think it would have been pretty cool if it locked the ring at whatever clickable aperture you set it to, like some older tactile lenses do, but instead it just moves the function from one dial you can accidentally bump to another. Though with this switch, you could set up your camera in such a way that no dials can change aperture, so I guess in a roundabout way it does accomplish what I've described. But surely astrophotography isn't the only thing you'd ever do with this lens, so what else is it good for? Well, I've seen Sony showing it off for portraits, and if you wanted to get really creative for a couple shots here and there, sure, the aperture is good for that. But quite honestly, I'm sticking to the 50 to 90 millimeter range for my portraits to ensure accurate proportions, and I think most of us just like the framing better anyway. One thing this lens actually does surprisingly well is macro photography. I know, from a wide angle lens, it's a bit odd, but some shots are kind of cool to try it with, and it would probably surprise you how close I was actually getting to these objects when I captured these shots. Of course, for the less artsy types, there are a couple practical applications. When you just need your outdoor shots to be as wide as possible, this thing does show some utility. Side by side, you can really see how much wider you get from jumping from something like 24 millimeters to 16 millimeters. If you shoot architecture or urban, I could definitely see this finding its way into your kit. And along those same lines, I think real estate videographers are definitely going to go for this new lens. The 16 millimeter field of view tells much more of the story than the 24 millimeter, and at a size that still sits comfortably on just about any gimbal. But a lot of you aren't here for the moving shots, so let's talk about long exposures. Our typical comparisons on this channel are about two or more different cameras, but today we're just testing lenses. These tests were completed on the a7R5 with an exposure time of 15 seconds, an ISO value of 3200, and a white balance of 4200K. These are the raw, unedited images. For this first one, I set both cameras to an aperture of f2.8, the maximum available on the 24mm G lens. Just like with the other tests, you'll immediately notice the difference in the field of view, which may come down to preference in a lot of cases, but it also has an impact on star fidelity. Even here, some star streaks show a little more prominently on the 24mm frames. For prints, that's not ideal, but for image sequences, it may be less of an issue. I've actually shot many time lapses on this 24mm lens using these exact settings, and if you use a low light specialist like the A7S III, you can get away with the loss in aperture by using higher ISOs, but at the cost of resolution. As we've demonstrated before, for most other cameras you're going to lose some details in the dark areas at f2.8, 
And that's why aperture really matters for astrophotography, as you're about to see. This is such a huge difference. Even on a camera that is pretty good with low light like the a7R5, the darker aperture is going to result in some noticeable loss in color for landscapes at the edges, or that green noise we sometimes see from an overdrawn Sony sensor. But that isn't a problem at all for the f1.8 image. And the gains extend to the star field as well, where even with the star to photo sight ratio disadvantage of the wider field of view, the absolute faintest stars are only seen with the wider aperture lens. And as you can see, the gas and dust clouds are also captured at noticeably higher fidelity. Even after we apply respective corrections to the raw images, it's obvious, wider aperture wins big. As we saw from the table shown earlier, wider aperture also at least to some degree correlates with a higher price for your lens. It's not easy to engineer glass elements that can focus an image with clarity across the entire sensor with all that additional light entering the receiving area. That's one of the things that really stands out with the new 16mm f1.8. It is the least expensive wide-angle lens made by Sony at this aperture. Now on the topic of price, I have owned and even enjoyed some inexpensive wide-angle lenses, and that actually presents an opportunity to really demonstrate the difference that quality glass can make. This image, shot using the 14mm f2.8 from Rokinon, doesn't come close to the data captured using the new lens. Heck, it isn't even competing with the other f2.8 here. So there you have it. You kind of do get what you pay for in this case. Now, it would feel a bit cruel to continue to hold this budget lens up against these Sony G lenses that each cost double the price you could get the Rokinon lens for. But let's consider it a stand-in for other ordinary lenses that may exhibit some of the same characteristics. Just about every wide-angle lens ever made is going to have a little bit of stretching at the edges. In this comparison, you can see it on both lenses, though more prominently on the Rokinon. To some degree, that can be attributed to the wider field of view, but despite the flaws, you can tell Sony has done some work to compensate for it here. You'll also notice that chromatic aberration, while not completely absent, is greatly subdued on the G lens. But one thing you do not see on that Sony lens is chromatic aberration. After several attempts to refocus, I could not seem to reduce these distortions with the Rokinon lens, which coincidentally also emphasizes another huge advantage to the Sony lenses. They both have no problem automatically focusing on stars in the night sky. But again, these quality of life improvements come at a price, and honestly, I'd say it's well worth it. Getting out to test this brand new lens for the last couple weeks has been a lot of fun for me. Any excuse to escape out to the desert is a good one in my book. It was pretty exciting to have such a capable lens with me for these shots, some of which I've been planning out for a while. For these foregrounds, I could not have done better, and I have personally never captured the true dark contrast of these dust clouds so exquisitely. I can honestly say that this is the best lens for Milky Way landscapes that I have tested to date. But which lenses have been your favorite for shooting the stars? If you have one in mind that you think could take the top spot, leave it in the comments and I may just have to add it to my review list. This year I have a few brand new products already lined up to test, so be sure to subscribe if you want to see those results. As always, thanks for watching and I'll see you on the next one.